All right, we're live. <laughs> Hooray. Good to see you, Cammie. Good to see you, too. Another and Monday Sex Explorer episode, Monday mornings. Gotta love Monday Sex Exploring. <laughs> <laughs> Super good to see everybody as well. Thanks for joining with us. This is the Sex Explorers podcast with Braxton Dutson. And I'm Cammie Hurst, host of the Sex Therapy 101 podcast. And I'm with Birds and Bees Podcast, and we are here today. We're going to be going over, again, this is Season 2. Um, so Season 2, we we neglected to state what book we're going to be reading for the end of this, but we opted with, you're going to have to look at your text message again, Cammie. <laughs> um, but we decided to, um, You Are Not Broken. Mm -hmm. So You Are Not Broken, and that is by, pulls up. KJ Kasparian. Yes. Yes. Kasperson. Kasperson. She's got a great podcast. Yeah. She's an MD, but she's doing great things in sexual health. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really excited for it. So you are not broken. Stop shitting all over your sex life. Boom. Oh yeah. That's <laughs> <not gonna show. laughs> yeah. Pick it up. We're going to be reviewing it. If you've noticed all of our seasons are about six weeks. We start and end with a sexy book club review. Yep. And that one's going to be a good one. So you can get that on Amazon um, or you can get the, the physical copy or you can also look in, uh, might as get Amazon and Audible, Audible, Audible <laughs> mixed up. <clears throat> so that's what we're going to be reviewing here in about four weeks, right? Cammie, we're going to yeah, four weeks. Yeah, we got four weeks. The and finale then, of season two. Yeah, finale season two. And then we're going to take a summer break and we'll be back in the fall, but that puts us with multiple episodes to revisit and reconnect with and also gives us plenty of time to hear from you, the listeners, for questions um, and issues that uh, that you think we ought to cover in, in future seasons. So keep those keep those suggestions coming. Um, but for today, one that came up <clears throat> uh, or the reason that this this came up is we got a question from a listener and she was talking about how um, the the question which i think would be great to bring up in one of our q and a's which we will um is all about shoulds mm -hmm. um is it ever or not shoulds i'm sorry it was about shame is there ever any good sexual shame and this was stemming from sexual shame from sexual assault <clears throat> and i was like wow we probably have better talk about what sexual assault does in like how to build sexual health and what you want to experience after a sexual assault because it's it's pretty intense. Have you worked with a lot of people experiencing sexual assault, Cami? Yeah, I have a couple, um, worked with several where there was an assault maybe in college, one later in life. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, abuse um, in childhood is far too common. And um, that creates a lot of the same issues for people. Absolutely. Absolutely. So today I wanted to um go over a little more of what oh i have to actually say that the slideshow is going to start <laughs> <laughs> so going over sexual health after sexual assault one way that um that i remember being explained to me and i really like this concept is if you have a whole pie and typically you've got pieces of a pie which is everybody experiences in life like if you were to break down braxton into Braxton's pie, a part of it would be um, husband, another part would be sex therapist, another part would be um, outdoor connoisseur, um, other parts might involve, uh, well, big part would be music, friendships, machinery, trucks, my trucks, <laughs> rebuilding, rebuilding old trucks, um, just all sorts of different things that we could, we could layer down certain parts of my life. They're like, oh yeah, that's kind of, and then big parts of my life. Mm -hmm. um, that take up an entire sphere and, and pie that makes up the complex person that I am, Braxton. Now, when we introduce sexual assault, I often see that then taking up 90 to what can feel like 100% of that pie. Mm -hmm. And that that's one that uh, can feel really scary. Just overshadowing the entire identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything. Leaking it, into every aspect of someone's life, yeah. Because it really affects everyone's experience 
with uh, safety, reality. Mm -hmm. um, now we've got different ways of identifying. Um, there's a lot that sexual assault brings to the table and mm -hmm. that's really, really stressful. So today I wanna talk about that and what can happen if you were a survivor of sexual assault and how we can start bringing back parts of those sexual health measures, as well as if you're a partner or a friend or a loved one of someone who is experiencing sexual assault. So <clears throat> know that if, uh, if you start to feel triggered um, in the conversation that's today, take care of yourself. Uh, you don't need to listen to the entire um, uh, episode today. But if you do, know that we're not going to be getting into any stories. This is going to be a more of an overview. This is going to be some of the things that you can start to conceptualize while we take that all-encompassing part that can seem to overshadow every part of life and know that over time and with um, support and help and therapeutic experiences, typically that only becomes just a sliver of your life experience or the person that you love, their life experience. Whereas right now it could feel like this is never going to end and this is just my life now. So take that into consideration. If you start to feel triggered or you have questions or you're like, yes, Braxton, and this is what I'm experiencing, send us a message. We would love to address this in our Q&A that comes up in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, do you have anything to add, Cammie? No, I think it's good that we're addressing this, you know, um, sometimes in the podcast world or the education world, keeping sexual topics fun and light makes a lot of sense. But in reality, people experience a lot of pain in this world, too. And so I think it's important to highlight that because it can be lonely for people who struggle with different realities um, when, you know, sexuality is addressed from a sex positive way with, you know, this is so great, this is so great, it's all about pleasure. And then there's a large portion of the audience saying, I, oh, I, I have a hard time relating to that. Yeah. So I think it's important to <clears throat> highlight the reality. I, I think that's important as well. So that's why as much as this is kind of a, a difficult conversation to have, this is what I think is important for us to, to dive into, at least as we're talking about sexual pleasure, it's important to talk about pleasure and, uh, and also what happens when we're on the other side, um, how we can get to that. Because oftentimes I think it gets overlooked when we start only focusing on what a sexual assault or sexual abuse looks like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the reason I'm going to start off with, uh, with the dual control model, you'll see a lot of this in the book, Come As You Are. <clears throat> but essentially the dual control model means there's dual, there's two control models. And one of them is essentially the accelerator. One is the brake. And you will see this show up uniquely for any individual person. But I think it's important for us to recognize what this can do during or after a sexual assault or sexual abuse. When we're looking at the accelerator, um, the accelerator can be affected. So some people that may have experienced um, sexual enjoyment to some degree, um, maybe in a site of an idea of uh, when stress came up, they would typically be in a less stressful scenario if they were engaging in sexual connection or masturbation. But now all of a sudden that's been shifted and it turns it more to a break. Anything sexual comes up and the, the break, the desire to move forward with anything sexual typically gets pushed on halt. Some people will go and have uh, their accelerator will be much more sensitive and um, depending on the experience that a person has, um, it's not uncommon to, to see people be like, well, this is all, you know, it, it's not sacred anymore, or it's uh, something that I guess people just use from me. So whatever, I might as well have fun with it. Or um, this is something I can get what I would like, or actually, this is the way that I feel alive. Um, and that the accelerator gets pressed more. So they're more inclined to engage in sexual experiences, sometimes more risky sexual experiences. The important part is not to judge, it's to recognize if you are the one that has been sexually abused or sexually assaulted and you feel more, wow, I feel like I feel almost out of control and wanting to engage in sex. Or you find that you're on the other end going, I would rather not even hear the word. I don't want to acknowledge sexual things. I don't want to engage in any of it. Um, that, uh, that plays a role in this as well, recognizing that your break may be really, really pushed on it. 
Yeah, there's no one strategy to survive this, right? Subconsciously, we all um, develop strategies to cope with events, and often they're not cookie cutter. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. I love the way you put that, Cami. Absolutely. Absolutely. So looking at the accelerator, um, recognizing some of these things, we're going to go from what you see to also what we're looking at, like how do we start to explore more of our sexual health? It's important to know what you're seeing currently. How do I feel pleasure? Do I feel pleasure at all? Do I feel way pleasure? Um, what do I like about my body? What am I also recognizing that maybe I don't like about my body? And oftentimes it's not uncommon to have sexual, secondary sexual characteristics or genitals be something like, I don't like that part because I felt betrayed by the person or by my body for some degree. Um, and then recognize also that there is sexual concordance and sexual non-concordance, meaning your brain may say, yes, this isn't a, uh, um, a distressing sexual experience. Maybe you want to engage in sex with a partner, um, but your body is not responding and you freeze or it's not doing what you want or your body is really experiencing a lot of turn-ons, but your brain is screaming no. Yeah, That's that real disconnect from the body and the brain. Mm -hmm. Yes. And those are really stressful to, to go through. So again, a big part of this is we're just hitting the surface. We could dive into each one of these things, but we're just hitting the surface. Recognize what this looks like. If you're a partner, there's a good chance that you may also recognize or have this explored and explained. And oftentimes the person can come across feeling like they're feeling crazy or they're feeling, um, a lot of distress and these are the things that are typically creating the distress from the sexual abuse would you say that that's that's what you've also seen cammy or you have others to add yeah no i completely agree that you know repression and obsession are just different sides of the same coin to me and so sometimes that comes into play um and um so we absolutely no judgment at the way we deal with past things that were out of our control. But often in this scenario, there is that war between self of body and mind at war and not being able to find congruence where the body and the mind are operating smoothly together. There's just so much, um, you know, like gears grinding as they try to shift through a healthy adult relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> so as we find these different things that are coming up know that um, a big part of what is going to be really important baseline at least how i would work with someone experiencing and working through past sexual abuse or recent sexual assault um, is building safety within the body recognizing safety within sexual expression um, processing past difficult experiences and then especially um, focusing and identifying not just the things that are distressing, but what is pleasurable, what feels good. And that may not involve genital touch for a little bit. Mm -hmm. it, it, it just involves what feels good and start to tap back into that when everything seems to be encompassed into pain and non-welcoming touch because it's been used as a, as a pain source. Right. Mm -hmm. um, big part that I find really helpful is also finding permission. Um, permission to say yes, permission to say no. Um, a permission to be able to uh, to have your experience. Um, know that pain is not a normal part of sex. So if you're experiencing emotional pain, if you're experiencing physical pain, it's important to stop, check, adjust. Mm -hmm. And it's really great if you have a partner that will do that with you, especially, again, bringing that safety and connection there, having conversations before sexual experiences so that you can build that safety and communicate what you need um, and start to relearn or re-engage a new form of sexual experiences that is pleasure focused and that also allows you to have control over the scenario because that's a lot of what sexual assault is, is being having control taken from you. Yeah, and I remember reading a research study, um, several of them when they're talking about the outcomes of um, non-consensual sexual experiences and I was talking about the more the individual feels like maybe it would have been a little bit their fault like maybe they went on the date or they got in the car or 
um, they weren't able to say no, that the more an individual feels like maybe they should have done something different, mm -hmm. the more internalized the trauma is of I can't trust mm -hmm. myself. So then the work is you've got to learn to trust yourself. But when um, a victim doesn't have that experience where they fully know that they, um, this was a um, absolutely uncalled for, they had absolutely zero responsibility in it, then the cognition of trauma becomes that the world is not safe and they cannot, there comes that hypervigilant of I cannot trust anyone outside of myself. Mm -hmm. And so for that individual, the work is to begin in these relationships to develop trusting a small group of people. And so when we talk about trust, sometimes people have different goals of rebuilding trust. Sometimes it's trust of themselves and other times it's trust of the world, depending on how you internalized the assault. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think this leads into one of the next things I'll, I'll be talking about, which is this responsive desire versus spontaneous desire. Um, all that gets affected just exactly the way that you were talking about it, Cammy. is that the, the, the person that broke the trust, the experience, how much control the person felt over the situation, what they feel they should have, that hindsight being 2020 um, is a real pain because it often comes back into, well, if I'd have just known, of course, I shouldn't have been doing blank, this, that, the other, I should have said, there's a lot of shoulds that can get brought into it. Mm -hmm. And know that each one of those, no matter what the situation, no matter what you do, where, engage in, where you're at, it's not a, it's not asking for things that break your value or that break your um, your consent. Mm -hmm. um, those are important things to know that just because you wear something or you do something or you're in a certain place doesn't mean like, yeah, well, you're asking for it. Um, and that affects this responsive and spontaneous desire. Um, oftentimes when we look into this, like it can affect if we have a spontaneous reaction to it, meaning like maybe beforehand you noticed that you were more open to being maybe flirtatious or wanting to uh, engage in sexual experiences more on a random spontaneous type of thing. Um, like it's reported higher in men and all of a sudden, when uh, I work with men that have experienced um, sexual abuse, sexual assault, um, something's happened to them where they was this uh, safety was taken from them. Oftentimes, it doesn't necessarily switch to responsive. It just switches off that we don't necessarily mm -hmm. see these desires happen. It's just like, nope. Mm -hmm. Has that been your experience too, Cami? Of I've, I've seen um, men, women just be like, ah, responsive, spontaneous. I just don't want any of it. Oh, for sure. Develops. And, you know, um, when you do some PTSD screeners, I think for um, individuals in an assault, what comes up really high on those scores is anxiety about avoidance of an aversion towards sex. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that can happen in other scenarios. There are people who can have anxiety about sex or avoidance of sex or an aversion towards sex, but um, for sure those those symptoms of PTSD come up for these individuals who have had an assault oftentimes. Absolutely. And so the reason I put this slide in here, we're like, wait, we don't want any part of it. So why are we talking responsive and spontaneous? Mm -hmm. This doesn't really make a lot of sense. An important part of working through the, you know, the pain, this doesn't mean that we jump to it where it's like, Hey, you've been sexually assaulted. Well, now let's figure out the spontaneous responsive desire you have. A big part that I, I put this in here is that, again, we want to bring in pleasure talk, or I would like to bring mm -hmm. in pleasure talk, even in the midst of sexual assault or people working through sexual um, pains. Mm -hmm. Because I think oftentimes what we end up doing is we can over, we can focus so much on the pain and the hurt and the story that has happened that is, again, not great. But then we also lose the focus on what what feels good. Because we mm. do a lot of focusing on what doesn't feel good and what where the abuse and the hurt came from. And on the other side, it's really important that we recognize, well, what things, do, what, what would a turn on look like for you now? What does, what is helpful? What is predictable? What is safe? What do you want to experience? Maybe you're more in a responsive side of things at this current time and you used to be in spontaneous. Um, maybe you need to just make sure you set up a space that 
works really well for you and allows for arousal to come. And when it does come, if you start to feel distress, mm -hmm. it's okay to back off of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That n nothing that happens is a required, oh, you're turned on now. So now you have to have sex. You have to do this thing. Again, this is where safety with a partnership can be really helpful um, so that you can work through some of these of a touch and go and really start to allow the the exploration of your sexual expression show up. It's yeah, it's completely a relearning process from mm -hmm. ground zero. Absolutely. Um, and then spontaneous, you may show that uh, you have more spontaneous desires. Again, there's no... Just because you've experienced a sexual assault or that your partner has doesn't mean that now you are going to be not interested or you're not going to have this, that, or the other. We respond the way that we're supposed to respond. It keeps us surviving and it may look different. So honor your process within it. Um, so if you're a partner, I want to talk to you about being a partner, a parent, a friend, um, what survivors may need from you. Um, cause I think oftentimes we're like, well, what do we do? How do we best help? We can get them to places, but then like, how do I help them heal? Do I have to tell them something? I've never been sexually assaulted or I did. And I don't know how to share with them exactly what I went through. These are some tips and some thoughts that I have about what survivors need from you. <clears throat> A big one first off the beginning, everything permission. Permission is so important. And I think so often we can re-traumatize because we as helpful, supportive people want to tell the person what they need to do in the moment. And that in of itself can be re-traumatizing. You have to go to the hospital. You have to do this. You have mm -hmm. to do that. Especially if it's right after a sexual assault. It's a continuation of the loss of power. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So being able to give them permission, even if you're like, I don't know if that's the best idea, permission to be them. Permission, permission to, to be in them. control. Yes. Mm -hmm. Permission to be in control. That can help regain sexual, um, again, their sexual self, their own personal self, all sorts of things. But having that permission, for letting them be who they are, um, knowing that they're normal and that their response is normal. Let them know that. Yes, of course you're feeling this way. Yes, of course you want to laugh about it. Yes, of course you want to cry about it. Yes, of course you want to forget about it. You don't want to talk about it. The spectrum is so big on how people want to engage and address this pain or this distress. It's normal. It is a, a typical response. All of those can be typical responses. There's not one way to feel or experience after memory or experience of a sexual assault occurs. Mm -hmm. um, get that helping support them with acceptance, giving them a space to be angry, happy, curious, resentful, any of the emotions that come up. It's going to shift and change as time goes on. Um, and then exploring intimacy. If you're a partner that's a romantic partner, again, that touch and go that we're talking about. See about holding each other for some time. Sex may be off the table for a little bit and know that that can be okay. Get support for yourself too, because it's not necessarily just going to be a walk in the park because you weren't the one that was sexually abused or, or sexually assaulted. Yeah. And I think sometimes too, grieving um, what you hoped your long-term sexual partner would be be capable of grieving that and saying there may be some non-negotiables here. They may be non-negotiables of situations or behavior, sexual positions, behaviors, contexts, and be able to, um, to grieve the loss of maybe some of the things you hoped for and be able to stay really curious and open to what can be created. Yeah, absolutely. I like that a lot. And I also like this, uh, we talked a couple of, uh, of, I think it was my last month's or my last season's presentation was on the four dimensional wheel. And I'm a big fan of this because it affects all parts, the spirit, the mind, the body, and the heart, and that emotional space, the physical space. So know that each person is going to go through their own process. And if you want to work through some of those, Gina Ogden has a great workbook, the four dimensional wheel, um, exploring, um, sexuality, like there's workbooks that you can kind of work through and exploring some of those emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual parts. Um, so I'm curious, 
Cami, even in this, um, I want to know um, what you've seen people experience, what their experiences have been. Um, but I want you as a, as a secondary survivor, people that are listening, or you as a primary survivor, someone that has gone through sexual abuse or sexual assault yourself, what are your experiences? Um, what would you say that if you were sitting across from someone, you wanted to help them or support them, <clears throat> or if you are the primary person that experienced it, what are the things that are uncomfortable to ask? Is it hard to ask for support? Is it hard to ask for um, connection? Is it hard to bring up the topic? What things have you seen being difficult to ask, Cammie? Um, I've seen, you know, when we think about some people fight, some people fight, you know, fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. Um, so I've seen it. Some people lose their words in the moment when things are difficult. Some people fawn and have a very difficult time setting boundaries and saying no. Some people have a very difficult time um, letting go of the fight response and opening their self back up to vulnerability. So those are, you know, some different things I've seen people have to do is can I open myself up to vulnerability or how can I find my voice to set boundaries or how can I um, make requests for what is pleasurable to me? And I think sometimes the partner may feel like they're at war between each other, mm -hmm. but I'll try to reframe it as us against it instead of me versus you. So that there's this idea of, oh, you froze. How do we overcome that together instead of I need you to use your voice when they may or may not have a capacity to do that at certain times. And so sometimes that's really helpful to work through with um, a therapist who can kind of be the stop and go light <laughs> with yeah. a couple as they relearn how to have boundaries and be vulnerable at the same time. It's like the trauma pushes them to one or the other, either really boundaried and walled off or boundaryless and, and unable. And so it's relearning how to do both at the same time. And I'll often try to rephrase, reframe it so that it's the partners against the difficulty that this created instead of one partner against another partner. I love that. <clears throat> the bringing the the two together versus you need to change or you need mm -hmm. to be accepting or you need this. Go, um, go get yourself fixed so we can have a good life together. Those kind of ideas that, yeah. you know, um, yeah. that doesn't help much. And I think a lot of these plays on both sides from what you were describing, like, is it uncomfortable to ask for sex to be off of the table for a moment while we ease back in? Is it uncomfortable to ask for help from a therapist? Are there questions that you're unsure that uh, that you want to ask? Um, what have your experiences in the past been? Oftentimes, it's not uncommon, unfortunately, for people to experience multiple sexual assaults or abuses in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so we're... I think we, it's what, one in four for women and one in six for men will experience yeah. some type of sexual abuse or assault. So this, this we're not talking about, you know, if you know eight people, if you know eight women, two of them have had um some type of sexual and i believe that that, that quote is from is is before the age of 18. It's, so. yeah that one's for before the age of 18. we haven't even gotten to college yet which is yeah. a really oh. common um time period for non-consensual sex yeah absolutely the uh and then we involve even more you know alcohol drugs mm -hmm. um hazing i mean there's there's so oh, sure. much happen and pressure so any and all of those play a role in this so what is you know have you had bad experiences in the past what are your personal expectations and i see that from a lot like well we should just get over it or um i'll just not do anything sexual ever again um or i just need to be okay those are personal expectations or expectations of a partner that sit that do come up and know that those expectations can show up if you're a survivor yourself and you're like, well, this is what I did. And so this is what they should do. Take a breath, recognize that there's no one way to address sexual abuse, sexual assault. Um, and it can be really hard to work through. It can be really hard to work through. Um, let's see. So, if you were in a higher drive scenario, 
um, say you're a partner or you actually find yourself in a space that you're feeling more high drive, um, whether it's partnership or you are the person, um, recognize what agreements you have in the relationship. This is probably the one thing if I were to take all these things off is build safety and get very clear with your agreements. Because if you're not necessarily clear with your agreements, there's more pain that can show up. It's really distressing in those ways. How about you, Cami? Yeah, and maybe maybe you can talk a little bit about the kind of agreements you're um, alluding to. When I think about agreements in this place, um, this transition toward healing, this the really yeah. you know specific space agreements I think of that I work through with clients is okay, we're going to agree to keep the six principles of sexual health. So if it feels exploitative, if it feels like it's not mutually pleasurable, mm -hmm. we both will be, you know, the cops on it, we'll both call it off. <laughs> and we'll say thank you to each other. We'll say, Oh, thank you for letting me know that you um, that I lost you or you slipped out of arousal and you went into anxiety. Thank you for telling me that. I only want us to have enjoyable sex together. Yeah. What can we move into? And so we have these agreements. We have, you know, um, game plans for what happens when it comes up because it will. <laughs> yeah. And um, that those game plans are full of permission and compassion and gratitude instead of disappointment or blame or, um, you know, a negative reaction. Absolutely. Whenever I think of agreements, I love those six principles of sexual health. I often come down to, if we were to baseline it, say a couple is in there saying, we're trying to work through it, or I'm working with an individual and they're saying, well, what, what agreements should I have? Mm -hmm. I often walk them through what, what are the levels of safety what do we need to experience? How do we experience safety? And that mm -hmm. is safety as we enter, safety as we exit, safety within. Mm -hmm. So in order to feel safe, I need to know that I can say no. That mm -hmm. typically is you know, on the consensual side in that mm -hmm. six principles. Um, safety. I want to be with a person that I feel close with. I don't want to have penetrative sex right now. I don't want to be naked. Mm -hmm. I, I want to work towards something different. But right now, can we honor that? That's developing expectations and then following through, being honest with what we do want or what we don't want. So that can lead into a really great pleasurable sexual experience. And that if there needs to be a pause, how do we pause? Where do we put the yellow light mm -hmm. instead of red and green? We're either doing this or we're not, or doing this or we're not. There's a yellow light in between where, oh, I saw, just like you've said a couple of times, Cammy, like, it seems as though that, like, are you okay? Are you here with me? No, I'm going back to that place. Mm -hmm. Okay. How can I help you just feel my hands, feel mm -hmm. my hands. I'll feel how cold my cheeks are. Mm -hmm. I'm here with you. We're mm -hmm. safe. Those things can be helpful when it comes to an agreement. The other side is maybe we're taking sex off the table for some time and we agreed mm -hmm. to check in in two weeks or two months as therapy is happening and we're planning on intimate connection, maybe without sexual action. Those, what are we agreeing to so that a partner knows, okay, I can be a support to this and we'll check back in at this point in time. I think oftentimes when we're like, I want to be a support and the person says no sex, we're like, great. <laughs> and then eventually the partner that's there to be helpful is kind of like, hey, I'm I'm still a sexual person and I, I want to be here to support 100%. But like, is this for two years? Is this for the next two hours? Like, I don't know what to expect. And so those Our agreements need to be sustainable. Yes. So yeah, I'll talk about that with, with couples when I'll see them making it, someone will be <laughs> maybe overextend their, what they're offering a person. And I'll say, wait a minute, is this sustainable? And they're like, well, what do you mean? Could you do that forever? No. Okay. So our agreement needs to be clear. Clear is kind. Clear is kind. Yeah. And I, I, and I like vague, doing that. Vague is not kind. No. And it can feel great at the time. You're right. Yep. Sex off the table. Mm -hmm. being great as a partner. Mm -hmm. Okay. The check-ins, it doesn't mean you have to be like, in two months, you will be ready for, mm -hmm. it's just, let's check in in two months of where we're at let's and where it's changed. Yeah. Yes. Because mm -hmm. things will change. Things mm -hmm. will change. Mm -hmm. So I think those agreements are really important as well as what, what sexual experiences are on the table. And I would highly encourage what is on the table versus what is not on the table because mm -hmm. If we really are saying like, well, I just don't want to do blank and blank and blank. 
that is three things that are off the table and that leaves a whole myriad of things. Then the brakes from the dual control model, the brakes are in charge, right? So much. Mm -hmm. so much. And we have to balance that out. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, if we, if we focus on what we do want and we get into a sexual experience and the partner that either the partner or the person that's experienced the sexual abuse or the sexual assault says, well, I really want to do this. You can hold each other and be like, are you sure you want to engage in this? We didn't talk about that. Maybe let's talk about it. And for the next sexual experience, we can do that. Mm -hmm. Then that creates a safe space so that we can say, well, we agreed upon doing these three things. And I want to hold that safety space for you. That can hold any type of people pleasing that might show up, any um, survivor responses that show up. We can make and hold, create a container space and say, we've agreed upon these sexual acts, and it sounds like you're open and interested to it. Let's not do it this time. Let's talk about it outside of the sexual context. That can be really helpful so that it doesn't feel like there's movement outside of consent. Yeah, yeah. So those are some of the that. thoughts that I have there. Um, but when we can go to, if I go back to these, some of the things to check in might be, what are your options for sexual expression? Who are the supports you can go to? Who do we share this with? Because secondary survivors need supports. Can they share with friends, some family members? Do they have a therapist? What are you sharing with your therapist? What, who can you go talk to that maybe isn't your partner? Some partners get really, they can feel hurt if they're not the ones that you're describing to, but they, they don't need to be the only ones you go to as well. Um, not forcing a process, what's available, um, identify what intensity feels okay, some things feel too intense, some things don't, and then work through your own grief. That is an important part that we look at, especially when we're looking at pleasure and connection. Sometimes we lose certain aspects of pleasure and connection that maybe have adjusted to where I don't want to do this act anymore, or I don't want to experience this anymore. And one partner or another may be feeling like, wow, I really looked forward to that, or I really like this thing, but yeah. I want to respect you. And now I've got some grief involved with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and um, I think the goal with therapy in this situation is to move, you know, when you're talking about the whole pie is to move the experience from it being ever present and us being hyper vigilant about avoiding a similar situation, moving it from that part of the brain back to a long-term memory where it's like, oh yeah, that hurtful thing did happen to me, but it is not ever present in my life. That window, is, that program is not always open and running in my brain. And um, it has gone to long term storage. And that can be done with someone who does EMDR, you know, first try talk therapy, if that doesn't work, then the next step is a specialized trauma therapy like EMDR or ART, which I'm kind of in love with ART a little bit at the moment. And um, see if you can get some movement in your own experience. And when couples rebuild, um, we reviewed, I wanted to send listeners to, we reviewed the sexual healing journey in a past sexy, sexy book club. And that's actually my favorite book. I recommend working through it with a therapist. So, cause it could be triggering, but the second half of the book is relearning touch as a couple. And there, she actually has a video. If anyone who's going through this wants to Google relearning touch videos by Wendy Maltz, it starts with really simple exercises so that the victim can, or the survivor can trust their partner in their own body. Instead of logically saying, I know I need to trust you, then through these physical experiences where it's like, um, first you just do hand clapping or moving a pen around and the the idea is I'm in control. And every time you start to feel the other person kind of take control of the pen or take control of your hand, it's like, nope, 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 starting over. I'm in control. And it's a way of getting your mind and your body um, to work together and to know that you're safe, at least with your partner, at least with that person. And we did review that book. So people can go to that past episode. Yeah, that's a great one. Great one. I'm glad you brought that up, Cammie. Mm -hmm. Um, I think towards the, I mean, this is the last, last slide here. Um, this is an old slide. I should have put uh, sex therapy 101 as well. So that's not oh, a, no, you're fine. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> oh shoot. I didn't add that freaking picture, but this one I'm like, oh yeah, I like <laughs> these aspects here. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sex therapy 101 is on there too. So uh, this is, this is a copy paste from one of my, my last ones. Um, but some resources on there. These podcasts, like Cammy said, from Sexy Book Club, 
to uh, Sex Therapy 101, Birds and Bees podcast. Um, we have resources and other episodes you can listen to about sexual assault, sexual pleasure, kind of working through those. Um, some of the things that, uh, that I think are great here is the come as you are, which we were talking to be able to recognize some of that and recognize the science behind the neurological responses to, um, pain and hurt versus relaxed and connected. Mm -hmm. And this is the Gene Ogden book, exploring desire and intimacy. That's a workbook you can work through. Um, and you you can respond this to your, to your therapist and the therapist can help work you through that as well. Um, I've also found that some people enjoy omgyes.com. This can also be triggering to some degree because mm -hmm. it does show vulvas. It's talking strictly about pleasure, masturbation, and touch. However, there is on, on every level from the beginning, it may not be one that you're like, oh, great, you've been sexually assaulted. Like, let's go to this one. But mm -hmm. as time's gone on, you might be like, what other touch? Because mm -hmm. this touch isn't necessarily on what I want to mm -hmm. experience anymore. What is there? Um, those things can be really helpful to, uh, I would nice. say, finding that. Yeah. And, and these are the ones I'll use a lot with couples is the, or with individuals, the sexual healing journey. And then, um, which is Wendy Maltz and this one reclaiming pleasure by Holly Richmond, which is, you know, um, a sex positive guide for moving past sexual trauma and living a passionate life. Have we read that one? We haven't read it. Mm -mm. We should add that one to our list. Probably. I like Holly. I've, I've I interviewed know. her a couple of things. She's cool. She's very cool. <laughs> Um, yeah, we had to put we had to put her on that list. Um, okay. That'd be great. Um, do you have any any other thoughts about? Again, this is just an overview of kind of what might be experienced. How we start talking about it. If you are interested as a as a as a um, as a listener, you're like, hey, you guys touched on it. This is such a broad topic to start touching the the surface of. What are you interested in? We'd love to hear what maybe the, a certain experience or you're like, Hey, I want you guys to dive farther into this maybe as a partner or as a survivor. Um, and I wanted to hear more about something. Let us know because this is something that we could dive into many different, maybe we'll make it a season. One of these goes around, but uh, um, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. We'd love to hear from you. I, I think one last thought I had that um, came to me as we were having this discussion is, know the room when you're talking if you haven't had a sex history with sexual assault don't center your experience as that being normal mm -hmm. that you know one in four and one in six before the ages of 18 someone's experienced sexual abuse or sexual assault just keep that in mind if that's not part of your experience and you're speaking as if oh my gosh it's so rare just be really cautious with your language in the rooms that you're in to not center your own experience of a lack of sexual trauma meaning the whole room has no trauma know that there's if you're in a conversation with coworkers or um your kids as friends or your own friends to just be really gentle with your language um, and just kind of know the room, <laughs> know the statistics so that you can be compassionate with your language. So you can have non-judgmental language um, because that can be re-traumatizing too. just walking in a society um, that is uneducated about reality, the reality of, these experiences that a lot of people have. I think that can be un untraumatizing just to be walking through a world who doesn't want to look at this reality. It can yeah. feel cold. Uh -huh. I, to add to that, know that you're, no one gets to really define what sexual trauma looks like. Mm -mm. Nope. Yes, there's the extreme side of saying that someone um, interacted with someone else's genitals without their consent. And that could look like rape, sexual abuse, and the molestation. And those are often seen as like, whoa, that's big. And mm -hmm. man, there's a lot of things that can feel very uneasy being spied on. Um, there, there's, so, there's so much. There's so much that feels like the invasion that's in there. Mm -hmm. So know that when someone's experienced something, take that serious um, and, and go with what Cammie was talking about, which is just being able to know that that's it's 
happening around you, whether you think it is or not. And, and weave consent into your social personality so that you don't assume people want to hug you as you walk toward them, that you say, are you up for a hug or a high five? Um, you know, I've got um, family members who um, don't experience touch in the same way that I do. And we have to weave consent into our life. Would you like a hug? No big deal. I love you. I'm sending all my support your way, high five, and just weave consent in. Do not assume you can touch people without their permission. Do not assume everyone wants to go in for a hug if they're friendly. Do not assume that touch is always kind and enjoyable. Just weave consent into your personality with compassion. Yeah. I love that. I love it. Weave it in. Weave it in. And that, that can mean everything. Even just that acknowledgement can mean the world to someone that is stressed about, I don't want to be touched and I have mm -hmm. to endure touch. Yeah. Or is this a conversation you'd want to have or would you rather not? You know, sometimes we start conversations about sex in a joking manner with our friends and um, trying to be sex positive by making, you know, a sexy comment or something. But we need to weave consent into our conversations also and be aware that not everyone wants to have that conversation. Yeah. Being able to say, oh, I this brought up a book I read, but it's about sex. Is that so where you guys are comfortable going or not right now? You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's all, all important things to be able to bring into our conversations from verbal, mental, physical, emotional. Yeah. There's a lot of things there. We've got to walk gently with each other. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I will say we want to hear from you. We've got a Q&A that's coming up in two weeks. And with the Q&A, there's even more that... Uh, that gets to be answered and we love having your questions come in. Thanks, Brandon. Braxton. I love how bold you are and that you were like, we're going to do sexual assault. I'm like, okay, here we go. So thanks for being bold and thanks for these slides to open the conversation. It's one a lot of us avoid having. And so thanks for being. Absolutely. Bold. Well, thanks for joining me on the ride with it because uh, <laughs> it's something that needs to be talked about, right? Mm -hmm. So looking forward to what you bring next week. Um, know that we've got that uh, the book, You Are Not Broken by KJ Casper Kasperson. And that'll come up in just uh, three weeks, four weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Four yeah. weeks. Yep. Okay. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Seeing ya.